This podcast is brought to you by Ride IQ. Ride IQ is a first of its kind equestrian coaching platform that will transform your independent schooling rides. Ride IQ members get access to the private mobile app with hundreds of on demand listen while you ride audio lessons taught by the world's top eventing, hunter jumper, and dressage coaches. Membership is only $29.99 per month, and every membership automatically includes a free trial. When you sign up at ride-iq.com. On today's episode of In Stride, Sinead interviews Kathy Barr. Kathy has been studying and teaching natural horsemanship for over 20 years. Earlier in her career, Kathy spent six years under the guidance of Linda and Pat Pirelli. She then joined the original Pirelli faculty and taught at the Pirelli Center for five years. Kathy is also a USDF gold medalist, a published author, and a specialist in horse development. Today, Sinead and Kathy are talking about leadership. We hope you enjoy this episode. All right, everyone. I'm really excited that we have my very good friend, Kathy Barr, on. And um, Kathy, I will say you have been like, you are right on my list, right at the top when we started this um, podcast. So I'm super pumped that you were able to join us today. And I think our audience is going to love your perspective and point of view and really kind of, um, you know, hopefully learn a lot from this and enjoy it. And I'm just so thankful you're here. So welcome. Thank you, Sinead. (laughs) Um, We were just discussing to everyone that's listening, Kathy is in Kentucky and you've got some ice right now and I'm down here in Florida and we actually have 30 degree weather. So wherever you are, well, not right now, it's 67 right now, but it's going to be 30. (laughs) Um, we hope everyone is staying warm and safe and, um, has, can turn on the heat to listen to this podcast. But what I, what I wanted to talk about today, really, you know, the last time you were down here and every time you've been down at copper line, I've really, um, you know, so enjoyed not even like working with you with my horses, but really watching your overall, um, you know, your, your overall like philosophy basically. And I think one of the things that's so nice about watching people teach a clinic is you can kind of pick that up, whether they're watching, whether you're, you know, you're working with an amateur or a professional. And, you know, one of the things that I thought just really stood out to me is what, um, what an excellent leader you are, not even in like, I'm thinking, oh, here's this leader in the middle of the round pen. I was just like, I just want to hang out with her. (laughs) Which, you know, in kind of a a funny parallel, like that's what we want to be for our horses, right? Like we want them to want to hang out with us. Um, So I really want to get to that, but I want to back up and let you tell us a little bit about how you got here and where you came from and how you got into these horses. And, you know, it was a sunny day mid, when were you born? (laughs) right? In the 1900s sometimes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about you and your upbringing and how you got into horses. Yeah, super. Um, you know, I was always a horse lover. Like my family always bought me horse stuff. Like any holiday or birthday, it was like, she's the one that likes horses. So get her a horse shirt or a horse statue or whatnot. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I got to the point where I could kind of work for some professional trainers and kind of get into that world a little bit. I was in Ohio, so it was more kind of the quarter horse world and that sort of scene. Um, and it got to the point, like I had this vision when I got into horses, kind of of the black stallion, you know, mm-hmm. where like horses like to be with us. They ran to us, given the choice, they'd rather be with us than away from us. And at the time and the showing, not that the showing was wrong, but the leadership I was under at that point, that wasn't the relationship we were having with horses. You know, at the time, my horse, I had a, there was a herd of 13 and to catch my mare, I had to bring in 12 so that I was like (laughs) the last option. And then I would like trick her when she went for a drink and like snap the snap on. So it was not a good relationship. So it was like an hour before you even got her. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. It was lucky that I got to like ride my bike after school out there. I had until dark to get her caught. (laughs) Um, So I just like got to this point. I was like, this is so far from what I thought it was going to be like to be with horses that I decided to completely get out of horses altogether, switch tracks. Um, and at that time I was, I was really fortunate because I just saw this little clip on TV and it was the first time I'd ever seen 
somebody riding a horse bareback and bridalist, and they were actually going over jumps and the horse looked happy and they did some flying changes and they could stop and turn. And I thought like, hey, that's a little bit closer to my vision of what, what horses could be like. Um, so fortunately I went to a, an event in the area where I got to see that person. And then I ended up going and uh, living on his farm Pat Prelly's farm for the next 10 years. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. So you did just kind of walk right into. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. So, uh, you know, like I always kept that thought that I get back into competing, but I wanted to get come at it from a place that I felt like my horse was enjoying the journey as much as I was, or at least after the competition, when I went out to the pasture, they came to me. Right. Yeah. You know, so. Wow. That's crazy. So how old were you when that happened? Like when you um, so I first saw, I, I was in college, so um, I was 19 my first year out on the ranch. Wow. Wow. And how long were you out at the Prellies? Um, 10 years. So I was out there for a decade. Some of us are slow learners, so it took <laughs> me a while to figure it out. Um, and I worked my way up from a working student, you know, cleaning toilets and washing dishes and that sort of thing. Um, to be getting to participate in some of the horse training things and uh, then becoming an instructor uh, mm -hmm. and then working on the faculty for five years and teaching the students that came in. Wow, that's wild. And so when you kind of, it's that's so interesting that from like actually a fairly young age that you were in a situation and you recognized without even having that knowledge that it wasn't quite right, like it wasn't quite a fit and that you had the yes. confidence to kind of, be aware of that because it, it's a lot, you don't see that that many, you know, I was out actually cross country schooling today and I was watching some stuff that I, I really didn't want to watch, <laughs> not my students, but, um, uh, but I thought, it, and in that moment I thought, you know, like it's hard because these guys just, it's what they know. It's what they've, what they've learned. And it's hard as a young person to look beyond that so do you do you was there something in there that you thought I mean do you really think it was from kind of watching the black stallion and seeing that that it just had a different you know you had a different uh, perspective you know I'd like to take credit for it and say like you said like I was really a strong youth and knew what I wanted <laughs> but I think it was sort of a combination of a ton of luck and kind of the direction I was meant to go like I was just yeah. around the people I was around in the competition world weren't great examples. Yeah. Um, and then I just happened to see a really good example of natural horsemanship. And right. the timing was right where I was kind of in that place where you could sort mm -hmm. of drop everything. I could take my horse. I didn't need, need to make money. I could just leave home. Mm -hmm. I was happy to work off my, you know, to, so that I could eat yeah. um, and, and take lessons. So I think the time, like, I'd love to take credit for it, but I think just the timing and the setting was really correct. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you can still take credit. I mean, I think there's, there's a certain openness, right? Like there's a certain willing to see it and then go, that's interesting. And I think most of the time that's really what you need, right? Is just that kind of openness to see something and then, then the opportunities show up or you are brave enough to follow it. But yes. um, that's wild. So 10 years. And so that whole time were you in Colorado? No, we traveled between Colorado and Florida. So I got really spoiled, which is why I'm yeah. complaining about the ice now. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, summer's in Colorado and winter's in Florida. It's so funny because you and I were probably like 10 minutes away from each other for right. like a decade <laughs> in Florida. I mean, the, the Pirellis were 10 minutes away from where we were at the O'Connors for the 10 years that I was going south. It's just such a small... Um, world, but now, now thankfully, all those worlds are starting to kind of bridge together. You know, which is how we ended up meeting, and and yeah. through, um, you know, the fact that you've done, you've gotten through, um, you've gotten your gold medal in dressage. You're out eventing. You know, we have a lot of similar uh, friends and trainers that kind of partake in in both and all the you know the horsemanship side of stuff and the competition side. So hopefully, those those gaps are um, bridging a bit. So and then. You know, sorry. I think both, sorry, I think both sides are so important. Like coming mm -hmm. from the more depth in the natural horsemanship world, you know, mm -hmm. there's that side I love, and now I feel like it's really time that I get a little bit more of their kind of competition side and the world of horsemanship on on that side of things. And I think there's a need for both. You yeah. know, a big value, and that's exciting to see more and more people kind of embracing both worlds because I think yeah. that's that's sort of the direction to moving forward to improving, you know, and coming up with a more 
holistic approach to horses so that horses and people can have this mental emotional balance Mm -hmm. while we're developing with each other. Yeah. It's interesting. I, um, you know, you're an author as well, obviously. (laughs) So I was reading your book, which I, I would recommend to everyone. It's called solving separation anxiety. Um, and it's very, it's a really, uh, it's a nice book to read. Like you, you pick it up and you're like, okay, I've got to get ready. I've got to get my, um, my, you know, some of these books you pick up and you're just ready to learn and you've got your notebook out. But this I find is very like you, you write the way that you teach. It's a nice, uh, it's easy and digestible to read. Very but, easy, yeah. but I, one of the things that struck me that you said in, um, in something <laughs> and it's so simple and I just hadn't thought about it. And it was talking about draw. And then it was talking about, our horses desire to be with us and our horses desire to be with the herd. And, and then you had this neat, you know, picture of kind of that teeter totter and all the things that the herd offers. And then like the one thing we offer, Yes, I know. <laughs> it was crazy. And I, I had never thought about that, you know, I guess just because I thought, well, like I'm nice to my horses, I think most of the time, but the 45 minutes I spend with them or the hour it is about work. And they don't have, you know, they're they're not sharing the same kind of vision of our future together and all the things that we're going to accomplish and blah, blah, blah. It's just kind of like work, whether I give them a carrot or not. And then with their herd, there's so much comfort and safety and food and rest and everything that's out there. It was like crazy. And I thought, God, I'm so self-centered. And I thought, (laughs) but I I just literally today, I just thought that, which is just a total mind shift you know yeah I think you know it shines a light on what a good salesman you basically have to be to your horse every day to get him yeah. to keep showing up you know because yeah. so much of their time so many of their needs their basic needs are met outside of us yeah which and we kind of and, and in our minds and I've I've heard it from people and I've said it myself I'm like well I fee- I pay the bills <laughs> yes, right I'm like, they don't know that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they, you know, their hay, hay magically ap- 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 appears in the field. And, you know, like, so when you're coming, I mean, this, you know, obviously is like, um, you know, such common sense to you and how you think about things. But, you know, how do we start that shift? Like, how do we start that horse shift or perspective change or something like that in everything that we do from our training to when we go get the horse out of the field? Like, what, what would you say would be some of the, uh, you know, the perspectives that you hear a lot and that are fairly quick fixes, you know, I don't know if that's a detailed enough question. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Well, um, I'll have a go at answering it and then you yeah. can redirect me. Um, <laughs> so when I'm thinking about kind of the relationship with my horses, a lot of times there's sort of four basic areas that I'm thinking about. So one is the horse husbandry side. That's where the, you know, best food, the best fairy, like all the stuff that you provide for your horse. And that's the stuff that makes sense often to people, you know, Mm -hmm. is he well cared for? But there's also an aspect when I'm thinking about horse husbandry, there's an aspect of looking at it from the horse's perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, does that horse need to be out with a herd 20 hours a day so that he can stay mentally and emotionally balanced? Or is he a horse that has to be in at night? or, you know, those, those sorts of things, so that it's the best approach for them. And then, um, kind of, you mentioned, does my horse like want to hang out with me? Does he want to be my friend? Does he want to be my partner? So I've got the the horse husbandry stuff that we look at. And then we've got, um, does my horse view me as a cool uh, herd mate? Does he want to be with me? Does he want to show up at the gate? Does he want to just hang out? Um, And then for those of us, for those amateurs or competitors that are doing things with their horse, then there's two more sides to that. Then I also think with my horses that there's this element where I'm their teacher. Mm -hmm. So that it's important now for me to create an appropriate learning zone, uh, an appropriate learning space where they can become, they can be safe enough to be a learner, but that I'm pushing those boundaries enough that they actually learn something new and we're not just, you know, practicing walk, trot, canter in the same circle on the same day. Mm -hmm. Um, And then for people that are headed towards competition, the fourth element of that that I'm thinking of is, can I be who my horse needs me to be as their coach? Mm -hmm. So on the day, when I get to the performance, are they coachable 
And am I being the coach that they need on that day so that we can get kind of the best performance available? So for me, it helps me to kind of think about what am I going into this situation being right now? Mm -hmm. So that at the show, I'm not trying necessarily, I'm not taking 80% of my time and going, well, now is when I need to be their friend and scratch their favorite itchy spot every single moment. It's like today I've got to show up as the coach. Right. And this is who I need to be on this day. Or today's like a, we both need a mental break. You know, there'll be some days like that where I go out and I'm like, I kind of need to be your teacher today, but really we just need to be kind of mental relaxation for each other. Mm -hmm. And we might just go hang out and graze or do the grooming stuff. You know, some horses don't like grooming, so then we don't do that with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't touch but, me. <laughs> um, but it helps me be clear in my approach for them because I feel like as a leader, we have to be a little bit different in each one of those roles. Yeah. And some days we have to fill every single one of those roles, mm -hmm. like another herd, like an entire herd of horses. We have to mm -hmm. have multiple personalities to be that herd for our horses. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, because that's kind of the hard, I mean, that's hard to break down and you've done it really well about, you know, everything can't be a priority at the same time. So who who am I when, you know, like, is it appropriate to be teaching the rain back in the warm up before you go into your dressage test? <laughs> right. You know, we probably should do that at home. Yes. And at the show, it's like, well, hopefully we just have enough connection to think about it. And if we get a four, so be it because I haven't learned it, but at least we're still, you know, in a positive place or something along those yeah, lines. Yeah. And I think at the show, I end up going a lot between like just being a friend and partner because there's some mm -hmm. waiting time, you know, like yeah. there's some, like we just need to be able to hang out. You need to like me enough to want to hang out with me. And I need to like you enough to be able to sit here and just sort of zone out for a minute. Yeah. And then switching back to like, okay, it's, you know, one minute or three minutes before I go in, turn on or put on my coach hat or however you want to look at it. Yeah, that's really interesting. I like that. I'm writing my little grid there. Um, and, and, you know, say you have someone that is, um, you know, feels like they're stronger in one suit than or another or you know you've got somebody that's quite a passive personality but they want to be a really good leader like yeah. how would you um you know how would you advise to get yourself in the right mindset for that you know because sometimes people think well actually let's back up a little bit because can you talk about what your definition of a leader would would be i mean that is a really good place to start that question i guess Sure. You know, when one I used to talk about leadership, I feel like we could write like a book or two about leadership because this is a massive thing. Mm -hmm. um, but to kind of break it down, I think it works in like each one of those categories that we talked about. It's the idea of being able to create space. And that can be physical space, mental space, emotional space, but create space. And then sometimes like on the day, it, let's say I'm being my horse's coach on that day and it's a performance. I might just have to create the right atmosphere and the right space and allow him to do his thing. And he is perfect. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need to create that space and then be able to direct and move and shape the energy within that space. Mm -hmm. and, and that we feel a lot with like extroverted horses where we kind of create a safe space. But if we allow them to go, the movement's kind of random. And so then we just not necessarily need to shut it down, but just direct it into a more positive shape. Yeah. Um, sometimes with more of the introverted horses, it feels more like creating the energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but like bubbling it up a little bit and moving it. And, um, and I think that each one of those roles, there's a place for that, you know, mm -hmm. like um, in the horse husbandry, maybe it's that my horse needs to be out uh, maybe I have an introverted horse and he needs to be in 12 hours before I compete so that he has a little more energy to shape. Right. You know, maybe he's a little bit fractious and he needs to be turned out until the hour before I haul him to the show so that he's ready to just chillax a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then creating the space as a teacher is an interesting one because Kind of to your point of let's say we have a person that's stronger in one area or not as strong or wants to develop in another area. Um, there's a point as professionals where we can just put that person in the role that's most suited to them. But a lot of us like live with our horses, train our horses, we're the ones showing them. So we kind of have to be everything. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I think for the horses and people, the times when we need to push ourselves to grow is in that learner role. So for example, I know I learn best when things are quiet around me. Like right. I'm trying to like read something or learn something new. I can't have my son playing with the soccer ball, running around the house with the dog, and then somebody cooking dinner and then music on. Like it just, my yeah. brain will not take in anything good. So for me to learn, I need to be able to have things super kind of quiet and level. Now, I also know that because I want to show, I need to figure out how to perform in chaos. Right. Well, yeah. So that that's going to be something that for me as a human, I intentionally put into my training ritual so that when the show comes, I can be a better leader and in that role, a better coach for my horse. Because mm -hmm. I have to practice being able to operate with that kind of high stress. Yeah. So that for us as a person, if that's hard for us, we have to practice it. If it's hard for our horses, we need to insert that into the training kind of teacher role and go, buddy, today's the day we're going to practice stuff with chaos. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, gonna turn, turn that music up. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. doing it, you know, in an approaching or an appropriate way so we both stay safe, but that it it pushes that bubble a little bit. I think you just said something actually really interesting too, which I want to um, pinpoint. Um, but it's that approach and retreat. A lot of times, like I, I have found this with myself and with teaching, sometimes when I know there's a problem or I'm teaching somebody that I, there's a problem or there's a horse, I've seen this a lot actually with students that come in and they'll either not go anywhere near the thing that they're worried about or 100% in the worst timing ever, like flood the situation <laughs> yes. and create a problem. So can you spend some time talking about the dip, like what you said that, that, you know, approach and retreat type of way to, yeah. to get used to those stressful situations. Yeah, there's, you know, I had a, a really good analogy once, and I often think about this, you know, um, for people who cook, if you've cooked <laughs> like Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner or whatever, and you've got like that one baked on pan that's like disgusting and hard, and you could like hardly chisel it off. Mm -hmm. um, you could go and you could attack that one pan first and you could spend the next two hours and it's still going to have little black pieces stuck on it. And to me, that's like the person who sees the issue and they just like hammer the issue and they go mm -hmm. straight for it. And then another approach is that we totally avoid the pan. <laughs> we yeah. wash everything that's easy and the next week it's still sitting there and in fact mm -hmm. it's worse because now it's moldy as well as we just throw it out <laughs> <laughs> which and uh, like joking aside uh some horses get that right mm -hmm. like they their issues get avoided and avoided until there's so many it's disgusting and dangerous and they get traded on for the next one yeah um but, and not that I've ever left a pan that long. I'm just imagining. <laughs> <laughs> never, never. <laughs> yeah. And there's this place right in the middle where we go, okay, I am aware that there's this huge, disgusting problem. And I'm going to fill the sink with hot, soapy water. And I'm going to put the disgusting problem at the bottom while I work on all these little pieces that are easier to fix. Right. And generally, by the time you get down to the bottom of that sink, it's mm -hmm. a little bit softer and a little bit easier to chisel away. Not because yeah. you totally ignored it and not because you bashed your head against the wall trying to get it to go away. Yeah. Um, so that's not an exact example, but like I try to think about that with the horsemanship. If there's this huge glaring thing, are there any little pieces around the edges or little connected behaviors that we could puzzle solve um, while that other one, we just sort of let it sit and yeah. see if it yeah. softens a little with time. Yeah. It's interesting. That just reminds me of, um, <clears throat> we had a horse a couple years ago that came in for us, um, for training and it was, it had jumped around some intermediates and I had it for, I don't know, a month or so. And I took it to an event and he was a little up and he, he honestly, he was, he's a pretty kind of fiery chatty horse, you know, always kind of had his emotions on his sleeves and um, but he was, he always did his job at home. Like he was fine. He had an opinion, but he, you know, he, he knew what the job was. Well, I went into the start box and he went out like a bat out of hell, jumped the first fence and then took me straight back to the trailer. And like, I, I had, I reacted. I didn't react at all. I was so shocked. <laughs> I was like back at the trailer. He's eating a hay net. I've still got my vest on. I'm like, how did I get here? And, um, you know, it was ridiculous. 
And I went to Tick and said, I don't even know where that came from. You know, which how many times has somebody said that to you? And you're like, okay, it came from somewhere. <laughs> um, and so Tick said, okay, when, when you ride him tomorrow at home, <clears throat> pay attention to every little behavior from the moment you put him on the cross ties to the moment that you get on him at the mounting block. And if you turn, if any behavior, like if there's a slight drawback to the barn, if there's a slight this, anything that you turn the volume up times 10 would look like what he did on the weekend. And just notice how many things he does. And I was like, oh, I haven't noticed. I mean, he hasn't done anything at all. I mean, he must have done a hundred (laughs) things. If like from the cross ties to the mounting block, to the hack around to the ring, that if I had turned the volume up would have taken me back to the barn, you know, and I just didn't even, but, and then I started from the cross ties, you know, like from the next couple of weeks, just started with all those little things. And, you know, the horse has done a couple of two stars now and he's been fine. And there's a little there, but it doesn't escalate, you know, like it it was very interesting what I didn't. And, you know, my thought was, man, I got to get to that next event, get back in that start box and just like get him going. Right. Which was, that is the idea of like, I'm going to just get that pan (laughs) and a shovel and I'm going to take care of it, you know, which is just uncomfortable for everybody. Yeah, no. And that's, that's the art of, you know, puzzle solving, like for you to be able to recognize that thing and then go, what are all the little pieces that could lead to that big thing? That's awesome. Yeah. Well, it was just tick saying that, you know, like, but well done, it, tick. He's, <laughs> he's, he's so smart. Um, yeah. that's, he's, I'm not telling him and he won't listen to this. I won't <laughs> let him. Um, <laughs> but it's funny how, again, we get so ingrained in our routine and we feel like, um, you know, like we're not abusing our horses and we're kind and nice and we, pay, we ride however many a day and we're paying attention that how much stuff you kind of miss because we're only looking from our human perspective and with our goals that are sometimes we're just not paying attention because our goal is in the ring, you know, yeah. or the yeah. goal at, at that cross country, I was thinking about the water complex, you know, like I yeah. didn't, wasn't paying attention. And because, you know, because our basic needs are different than the horses, the little things that they do, if we were to interpret it through kind of our uh, human predator brain, it doesn't mean the same thing it does for them. hmm you know, like that little step when we're uh, doing up our saddle, that little step that they take towards us, you know, we just think, oh, he just, you know, was stomping at a fly and he happened to step down closer to us. No, nope, that was him uh, being able to move your space. Yeah. He was like, hey, you know what? I'm going to create my space and I'm going to move you in my space. Right. And so for him, like it starts, you know, him or her, it starts mm-hmm. right there where they're all the time, like as soon as they see us, they're checking out these little things. Mm-hmm. If I do this, do they notice? If I do this, do they notice? Because that's, you know, from a super basic level, that's how they stay alive. They have yeah. to pick the leader that's going to notice those things. It's going to be perceptive to those little changes because otherwise they get eaten. I mean, you know, from a yeah. genetic perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not a huge fan of horse. Um, <laughs> no, no, completely. So it's it's really that idea of, um, yeah, being present through all of those little moments. And and you know, have you through your work with multiple different horses, have you found horses that really have been? I'm sure you have. Um, you know, really uninterested in um, having a leader and really had to spend a lot of time making, you know, kind of, I, I don't know if assert is a, assert yourself as a leader. Is that the right word? Is that too aggressive? Like how, how would you do that as far as if a horse was kind of uninterested in, you know, like they were just a strong personality maybe. Yeah, that's, it's a really good question. And I don't mind the word assertive at all, but some people have a negative thing with it. Mm -hmm. So I think the most important thing is to find a word that sits well with you or if you're talking to a student that sits well with them. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are some horses that are really self-confident. You know, Mm -hmm. like my vision, one of my biggest pictures of a good leader is a horse that I used to have. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had her as a teenager and she's a big Pertron thoroughbred, almost 18 hand black horse, lots of presence. Um, and she could create space like she was one of those horses you could turn around a new herd of horses. And I, I don't 
have any memory of her ever biting or kicking or hardly ever pinning her ears at another horse, but she would walk into a pasture and it was like all the other horses were like, there she is. <laughs> and like, just, like, horses would part out of her way. They'd like <laughs> fall in behind her and they just follow her anywhere. She was incredible. Right. You know, so it, it's interesting to say assertive because did she, could I have ever taken a video of her asserting in a right. dominant way, her leadership? No. But she had this ability to create a space where she didn't even need to. You right. know, the other horses just felt the energy and felt. And you can see that with like top level horsemen. They just walk up mm -hmm. to a horse and the horses kind of go, ah, like right. they're just whole being softens and they're ready for that leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so when I think of leadership, particularly from the friend partner perspective, like she's kind of my vision. And, you know, she funny it's a side story but she um she saved me from a bear one time okay we were <laughs> her, her ability to control energy wasn't just with horses <laughs> but, uh, so we were out in colorado and i was on a uh so the ranch was surrounded by like national forests. so there's lots of kind of animal land and those sorts of things where anything can exist <laughs> So we had a I had like a free hour. So I hopped on her bareback with just the halter and I ponied, I was ponying my other horse because there was some really good grazing up in the national park. So we were on the on the woods, in the woods of this little trail, and on the way up, I noticed uh, over on the side a black bear. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, cool. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, like what do you and she's like happily grazing or gathering berries or whatever she was doing. And so I just thought, oh, I'll just um kind of go on past and as I'm passing I noticed she also has a cub with her mm -hmm. which is fine right but I mostly passed and like just mind your business Kathy like keep your focus up here so we go we go up and do our grazing and then I come back down and on my way back down I'm really tentative in that area and I'm looking and I don't see the bear at all and my horse is staying calm and I'm like okay this is fine I'm ponying the other one I'm still bareback got my halter and then all of a sudden my horse goes from like 18 hands to like 21 hands and her whole body expands. And I see out of the corner of my eye, this black bear charging out of the woods straight at us. And it was one of those moments, like I had no time to do anything. Right? Like I must have, if there was a video of me on her, I'd be like, like oh nothing's God. happening. Right. And so she grows and you know that noise they can do where they like fill their lungs up and let it all out. And it kind of sounds like a dragon. She was like, Poof! yeah. And, and uh, the black bear stops. Like I could have touched it with my foot is how close it is. The bear stops, turns and runs off into the woods. Oh and, my and God. Like nothing is registered, right? Like, I'm <laughs> like, like what? <laughs> And then, and my horse does this like little passage for like six steps. And then she goes, and then we walk on home and her head is down. The horse I was ponying way smaller than her. It didn't even see the bear. So oh my it God. Was, it was insane. insane. That's insane. And she, and as soon as like she brought her energy up, changed the energy and intention of the other animal. And then as soon as it was done, she was like, boom. Wow. So. I never really felt like she accepted me as her leader. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I just feel like you do whatever you want. I'll just. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the best I ever got to with her was kind of that like friend partner where she's like, yeah. you're all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, she's my kind of in the back of my mind. She's always that horsemanship horse that I think of yeah. for that leadership. Yeah. Um, so yes. Have I come across horses like that? And do I always know exactly what I would have needed to be her leader? No. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is an aspect of kind of earning the right on some of those really self-confident horses. Like, mm -hmm. I just have to be better with my timing, have to be better with my feel, have to be better with my understanding until they at least get to the point where they're like, okay, you can yeah. play in my arena. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. <clears throat> yeah, because it definitely comes down to a certain responsibility, especially in competition and things like that of a skill set. It's like, <clears throat> are you a leader that you would follow? And are you making good choices? Are you putting that horse first? Or are you, are you, you know, when you're jumping jumps, are you, <clears throat> you know, putting them to an appropriate distance? Or are you asking thoughtfully what you want or appropriately? I think you said that a couple of times. Um, earlier, like an appropriate response to what, um, 
you know, the feedback that they're giving you or that, you know, a, a certain awareness. Um, and I yeah. think that's, you know, that's on point because it's not just getting softer that yeah. sort of with the horses that makes the difference. You know, it could be the clarity. It could be getting them to the appropriate distance so that the job isn't harder than it needs to yeah. be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's keeping it easy. Yeah, that's some of the trickiest horses that I've found um, as far as partnerships um, in teaching are those horses that do have, and, and self-confidence is a good word, <clears throat> actually, because sometimes we, you know, my, myself included, kind of pigeonhole them in like, oh, they've had bad experiences or they're being, um, or they're being ornery or this or whatever. And when they're actually just really confident and they're kind of like, why, why am I doing this? Like, yeah. <laughs> this doesn't make sense to me. And, and those horses I have found, they just need you to be fair. Like it needs yeah. to be fair. Like it does, you don't need, you don't need to be soft and you don't need to be tough. You just need to be fair. Yes. And, you know, the, the, and in a percentage of, you know, you need to kind of be on that 80 percentage of asking a fair question for what they're capable of. And then they kind of go, okay, fine. You know, I'll, I'll do that. But those ones can be really difficult to, um, you know, pair honestly with amateurs. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> you know, which is a hard conversation to have sometimes. And, and is that a situation that you found yourself in before when you've had horses come to you for training or, or whatnot, where you've kind of said, this is the, the horse personality that you have and you can get better. And if you tell me this is your horse of a lifetime, we can work on that, but it's going to be a difficult road. You know, maybe something else would be better suited. Yeah. And, um, you know, we try to be pretty honest that way. And the nice yeah. thing for the people that are in the natural horsemanship world is a lot of times, if the horse is not necessarily the best match for riding, mm -hmm. we have the ground skills that mm -hmm. we can direct them to. Yeah. So that a lot of times it's like, uh, uh, particularly if you have maybe a person who hasn't ridden much or mm -hmm. they not, or they're a little bit later in life or their balance mm -hmm. isn't as good anymore. And they might get really attracted to like a crazy athletic youngster, mm -hmm. which is gorgeous, but mm -hmm. in kind of a high spirit level and a high energy level, that might not be, you know, the experience level of a rider and the natural drive and athletics of the horse aren't really the safest combination. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of times they can still have a lot of fun playing with them on a rope or online, or they can have a lot of fun at Liberty. Yeah. Um, where they don't need the human doesn't need quite the field timing and balance as a rider and the horse has a little bit more freedom to kind of express himself and be athletic yeah. um, and sometimes in the horse's education and life like then those two end up coming closer together and mm -hmm. eventually they can be a rider or you know be a good match in the riding kind of arena yeah. um, occasionally it's awful <laughs> you know, like, might be like this horse is not a good picture you know, in any, any realm of, you might yeah. be able to be a good owner, <laughs> yeah. so what yeah. else? Um, but usually uh, with the natural horsemanship base, like there's an avenue where they can be good partners. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, a good angle. Right. And it's kind of explore, I guess then it gets a little bit personal, like what actually are your goals and what do you want to achieve? And yeah, <laughs> maybe sitting on down. a ride, you know, once a month and be safe with that. Like this isn't a good pick. But if you just love this horse because you love him and you want to do anything for him, then we can set up like a program that's still going to work for you. That's going to work for you. Yeah. Um, and how much of that leadership role, um, you know, as a, a rider or not even a rider, someone on the ground hat, like if you were to put the word confidence or self-belief in there you know, how much do you think people are, are born with and how much do you think that they can, you know, learn and adapt within the right program? It's <laughs> a big question. Um. <laughs> well, I'll back it up. I can back yeah. it up because I was, I was doing a podcast. It's not out yet. It'll be out next week with um, Kim, Kim Severson. And she's, you know, she's an Olympic gold or an Olympic. Yeah. Team gold medalist, uh, individual medalist, WEG medalist, you know, win Kentucky three times. And she is a really um, awesome human, but she has an incredible innate self-belief. And that's kind of her, um, you know, she's like, you got to believe in yourself and you got to kick some butt and you got to, you know, be that type of way. And I'm like, it's, it's a really enviable um, place to be, but it's kind of like, well, what if you're, that's not your innate. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. you know, being like, what do you, how do we, how do we make that, you know, you know, and that we might be backing up a little bit because I know we kind of had this conversation, but, um, you know, how do we improve upon that? And is it necessary? Yeah, I think I think there's two aspects. There's the innate character portion for humans and horses, and then there's also the learned. Um, and I think as a like, if I were to generalize, I think in uh, kind of natural horsemanship, often not enough credit gets given to the innate character. Right. And it kind of gets considered like no matter what I want, if this horse is trained enough and developed enough, he'll be able to do it. And that's mm -hmm. not always accurate. And the same thing for people like um, I think I think it would be very cool to be able to run and be like a sprinter and a fast runner. Mm -hmm. My innate character is never going to <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps also my innate drive to work hard enough to yeah. overcome my innate character, right? But that's not something that's natural for me. Right. Um, and I think a lot of people that I run into that are kind of more from a classical background, they often don't um, give enough credit to the training. Like, you know, they might have a horse that's 10 years old. And a lot of times they're like, he's just, you know, really great. Or he's always been bad at this. And sometimes you can go, well, you know, like that's something you could make better. Or yeah. that's something that was fixed. So I think uh, they're both really important. And depending on who you talk to, um, experts in the different fields and whatnot, some will say it's 80% innate and some will say it's only 20% innate. So I think um, that's open for interpretation. Mm -hmm. And if you're someone who has like a dream or a goal and you feel like there's a not a enough innate character to get you there, then just go with the idea that 80% is learned and work right. at it anyway. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's more stories of people being successful that have wanted something hard enough that they yeah. want it as bad as they want to breathe or to eat and they make a, find a way to make it happen. Yeah. 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 No. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's like, okay, if you're if you're a little negative in this part in the innate characteristics or or whatnot, you just have to overcome it with the other side, like what you're willing to do, how hard you're willing to work, what that drive yeah. is. Yeah, what you're what you're willing to sacrifice there. And that kind of brings me up to my next question, because you kind of straddle both worlds, um, you know, in the horsemanship world, in the competitive world, um, you know, I, I feel like on both sides, there's some misconceptions as far as, you know, in the competitive world, a lot of times people are like, oh, what, you know, you're just playing with a horse and playing nice and around pen. <clears throat> and then in from the horsemanship side, sometimes people look at the competitive world and think it's, you know, it's too cruel, it's too fast, it's too much. Um, you know, how do we kind of, you know, bridge that or continue to bridge that? I mean, is that something that's going to happen over the next, you know, 10 or 20 years as um, people speak about it more or become, because I think sometimes in the, in the horsemanship stuff, like you guys are so educated and so well-spoken and I, I would say it's more, you know, a lot about how horses learn and their behaviors and their science that's backing it up. It's not like this whispering mystery that, right. you know, <laughs> that people can't learn. That is really something that's going to contribute to performance. But, you know, how do we get there? And if you were to, um, you know, talk even personally about, you know, how, how you view yourself in both of those roles, because you certainly, you know, kind of dabble in all of it, you know, how do we get there? basically. Yeah, that's an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> Another big one. I think, the best, you know, I think the best way is to have to continue to have professionals that do both and do both well. And, yeah. and, you know, that share the light that there's value in both so that we don't get people in natural horsemanship that are like uh, putting competitors down or saying what's bad about it. And then competitors start to embrace that there's a bit of value in um, some of the natural horsemanship stuff you know, mm -hmm. as many are. Um, so I think kind of from a holistic point there, like I would say that because I've spent most of my horse education focusing on the natural horsemanship, that's where I kind of consider myself a professional. And for sure in the competitive world, I'm just an adult amateur. <laughs> you know, like I just like own horses and I'm the, I'm the groom when I go to the show, I'm cleaning out their stalls, I'm prepping them, I'm getting the next one ready, like I'm turning in my entry fees. So um, I'm just figuring that out. And I feel like I could have a whole lifetime. And I think you had mentioned in an earlier podcast, and I loved it, uh, the idea that there's like drivers and mechanics. Mm -hmm. And that kind of concept of like, 
knowing how mentally, emotionally the horses are put together. And then there's this other side of it of being, there's like a whole art form in knowing how they're physically put together. Yeah. And there's a whole art form in knowing how to be the coach on the day of the competition. Um, and, uh, and they're all valuable. And I think there is like, we're always going to have to have specialists in each one of those fields. Cause we don't, none of us live long enough yet. To do <laughs> excellently. Yeah. Um, but I think just being aware that they're all important is kind of the beginning stage. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too, that, um, you had said it earlier, <clears throat> you know, talking about, um, different types of horses that before a competition, one might need to be out all night and one might need to be in all day. And there's all these different equations for the best performance for your horse on the day when you go out to either just have a training ride or a lesson or a cross country school or go to a competition is that there's all these little pieces. It doesn't have to be just, I just need to ride really, really well. That's actually like just a small part of it. You know, like your skill set is, uh, is important, but it's one small part of it where there's so many of these other pieces, you know, going back to your your pot analogy, your, your kitchen pan, not your pot. Yes. Can't yeah, say yeah. That these days. <laughs> um, you know, analogy, there's so many different little pieces that we can take care of um, before we actually, you know, and it kind of makes the whole thing level out and a lot more um, comfortable, but each individual horse, once you get to know them <clears throat> and what works for them, you know, you can make that equation a little bit more specific for, um, yeah, for a better, more successful performance. Yeah, and I, I feel like the natural horsemanship lets me know, like, um, one of my main guys that I was showing in eventing, he's a little bit more of an introvert innately. And for him, if I were to take him out and, like, hang out with him at the show for a couple hours, let's say he's stalled, and I hang out for a few hours, and then we go, like, on a morning ride, and then we go on a little walk, and then I show him. By the time I got in the show ring, he'd be like, <laughs> yeah. like he's, he's past done you know yeah. like i've used all the cream on top and then like three quarters of the milk like we're down <laughs> to the top to the bottom yeah but then at the same time at that point i was showing another horse that was an off the track thoroughbred and he needed to go out for a morning ride and then a walk and then another ride and then a walk and then mm -hmm. go on the show rings then he was ready to go <sighs> and by the way, if there's enough space, could we go for a quick gallop before we go on the dressage ring? Because then I'm ready to learn. Yeah. Um, so kind of having that background and going, neither one's right or wrong or means that I'm failing or like, this is what this individual needs to show up and show off his best. And right. this is what this one needs. And what would you advise people at home? How would they, how could they start to learn how their particular horse is in the right mindset to learn like in a in a calm situation what could they notice or what could they practice at home so that when they feel like the horse is elevated they can try a few different things to try and get them back to that neutral or that zero place like how could one start to you know if somebody was going to go out tomorrow and go okay I'm going to try and assess and figure yeah. out where my neutral is like how yeah. how could they do that uh, the first step would be, I think, be conscious of it. You know, like a lot of times when we're riding, we sort of go, well, I know my horse has trouble if the manure bucket's moved. I hope the manure bucket isn't moved, right? <laughs> but to like get the, get the trainer mindset and be like, my horse has trouble with the manure bucket being moved. I'm going to move it today. And then I'm going to try ABC. Right. And then tomorrow I'm going to move it to a different place. And then I'm going to try DEF. Right. So that each time we go and then you just see the result. I yeah. mean, you know, it sounds, it's like you have a 50, 50 chance, like whack him or rub him, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but you know, like just making it that simple and going, well, this is a problem. Awesome. This is an opportunity for me to learn something more about my horse and what's going to work. Right. Because particularly if you're riding your horse off your property ever, there's mm -hmm. going to be a scenario that brings your horse's stress level up. And if you yeah. can know what works best for him, to prepare him for that situation and then to respond when it happens, you're going to have a way bigger tool chest that you can pull from. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good advice. Cause I think sometimes <clears throat> we get so used to how they are at home and then we, we just train, Yes, you know, and the, and the, one of the things that is so important is that not even just, I mean, it's obviously important that they learn their ABCs at home, but then how do you make sure they're listening and can hear those ABCs when they're so distracted or adrenaline's up or anything like that at a, at a show? Yeah. And like for me, like to kind of go back to my learning style where I said I needed things quiet. 
Like I know for myself to be able to perform in like a high chaos situation, I have to be six steps better than that at home when things are calm. Right. So that by the yeah. time the chaos yeah. comes up, it's unconscious competence for me. Like yeah. if I'm having to think about how to be good or think about how to be correct and the chaos happens, I am going to fail. Like I will put <laughs> money on it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but if it's going to be chaos. And so I think about that for the horses too, particularly the horses that are introverts as learners. When there's all this external chaos or static or anything, they need to for it to be so good and such a practice skill that it they don't have to even be conscious that they're right. responding the way we need them to. Yeah. Um, and that's part of kind of creating that space because that's creating a space where my horse can perform at his best and me mm-hmm. knowing that as a trainer and going, this horse needs me to be this much better at home so that when the chaos happens, he can at least perform here. Yeah. yeah. And then you have the rare human and horse that do better in the chaos. Right. And there yeah. that's awesome. Because then you just yeah. like keep going. Yeah, you just do life. <laughs> you do it. Guaranteed you chaos. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I I remember David always like when we were like younger riding over there, just at home, he's like, I need at home to be practicing at a hundred percent and I know I can go to a horse show and be at seventy percent and still win. You know, like it's always going to take away. You're always going to that pressure and those situations. So you just need to be operating at such a level at home that when you go there, you can be at 70 percent and still be winning, Um, you know, or or successful, whatever that looks like to you. Yeah, yeah, that is. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. You can, you know you go and cross your fingers. Well, I don't have a medium trot at home. Surely it'll show up at the horse show, you know, <laughs> and then, like, some, sometimes it does if something's chasing you, but. <clears throat> and then I think on the note of like making sure that the show goes well, for me, it really helps for me to set my prior priorities before I go yeah. because I'm a bit of a competitive person. So mm-hmm. if I don't make a conscious effort of setting my priorities, my priority will be to win. Yeah. Like, I don't care if I come out less healthy mentally, emotionally. <laughs> yeah. you know, it'll be easy for me to throw my horse under the bus mm-hmm. and then I'm going to judge my success on, did I win or not? Yeah. It's not everybody, but I know for me it is. So mm-hmm. I have to take that competitive side of me and redirect it, not shut it down. Right. Just like with the horses, just direct it and go, okay, instead of, or the focus could be winning, but what would be really important to me? Maybe mm-hmm. the focus is, um, that, uh, I get my horse so relaxed cause they've been tense that they blow out mm-hmm. in a, you know, the relaxed way in the ring when mm-hmm. I do my, uh, free walk mm-hmm. or maybe it's that, uh, I remember to, I had one where I had to remember, I told myself in the beginning that I had to say good boy after every jump that we cleared <laughs> that was to make sure I was breathing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would go in a jump, I would go in a jump round and I wouldn't breathe. And yeah. I'd come out and I'd know because I'd be out of breath and all red. Yeah. And so I went, all right, at the end of every, as he lands and we've landed successfully, I'm going to say good boy because it's hard for me to talk and not breathe. Mm-hmm. So uh, so by setting those goals mm-hmm. and going, I'm going to say good boy, I want to hear him blow out in my free walk. Then it keeps my competitive brain on track in a way that takes my horse along for the journey so that they mm-hmm. can enjoy it as well. Yeah. Well, and I would say it also keeps you very present in the moment. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it keeps you focused on what's important, not just winning. I mean, yeah. I mean, winning is good, but <laughs> it's often a byproduct. Um, <laughs> you know, like, like, even in a training session, if I go out and my goal is like flying lead changes, then it's mm-hmm. easy to throw the rest of the training out the window because today we're working on flying lead changes. Yeah. Whereas maybe I need to be thinking about like softness off my left rein or downward trend or whatever it is. Yeah. Right? Yeah, no, totally. Um, we, I, I did a, a thing actually on Ride IQ, but it was a big habit I got into last year with writing down before I went to a competition, my hard and soft goals for each phase, you know, like the soft goals just being, <clears throat> you know, something to do with the, the overall feeling, you know, I want to have a nice relaxed test. I want to stay present. I want to feel like my stress level doesn't get here, you know, that my warm up is nice. And then the hard goals is, you know, I want to score under 27 and on the flat on this horse and looking at my history, that's a realistic hard goal. I want to jump a clear round and I want four seconds of time on cross country and a clean cross country round, you know, like so that you can exactly like you said, you come out and you can then assess after the event or the show or the whatever or the yes. school <clears throat> and say, I hit this. I didn't hit this, but it's very tangible. You know, like yes. it's very 
uh, you can train, you know, for right. it. It gives you a place to move forward from. You're not just mm -hmm. like it was success or failure. It was like, oh, this one didn't work. Here's the pieces that I'm going to work towards. Yeah. yeah. And I, oh, and like, you know, even going back to some external stimulus and things that get the horses going, like I didn't hit that hard goal because I didn't hit the soft goal in yes. warm up of a uh, relaxed and planned you know, there was just no way I was even going to get there. So how do we, that's more important to practice moving that bucket at home yes. than it is working on that rain back, exactly. yep. <laughs> you know, because we're not even going to get there. Um, and so, then, and then that makes it, that makes it more rewarding when you are just moving the bucket at home. Cause you're not yeah. like, I'm not working on the important stuff. You're like, this is the important stuff. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Well, and I think it's, it's kind of nice now, even in our, um, our dressage, uh, scores. Some people like it and some people hate it, but that they just moved all those collective marks to just a harmony score, which I think is awesome. You know, like, I think that that's kind of the point, isn't it? You know, um, yeah. is that it needs, that needs to be really, really important. Um, and that needs to be like, I liked when you said that you kind of go back and forth at the shows between being that friend and a coach. And those are the two hats you put on, you know, instead yeah. of, <clears throat> you know, the trainer or this or that or whatever, it's like, you know, you got to be their friend and be aware and notice if they're worried or stressed out or we got to hang out or we got to chill out or we want to spend some time together. And then also here's the strategy. This is what we're doing. We're here, you know, we're not yeah. here for the beer. <laughs> yeah, right. And I think that, you know, as that coach role, that's where uh, it gets really clear. Like you were saying, you know, horses, those strong, uh, strong willed horses basically just need things fair and clear. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that clarity is so important for them. You know, there's a, there's two edges, like just like when we're driving, there's like two lines, you know, it's mm -hmm. not just one line. I'm not just giving treats or I'm not just whacking them, but that they can have those two edges. And I think yeah. that specifically for horses helps the clarity. Yeah, I was. That's funny that you said that, because I was going to ask you a little bit. We've had a lot of conversations here lately because we had Shauna Koresh out and then we had Dan James out. And, um, you know, and so talking uh, a little bit about that positive and negative reinforcement and just, you know, knowing you and then reading your book, it seems that you walk that line really well between giving, you know, comfort and pats and treats, but also being well willing to kind of take some of those things away. Can, can you talk about that line a little bit? Yeah, through, through the books that I've read and the people that I've studied in things, I think, uh, you know, they've alluded to the fact that horses as a species are one of the species that do really well with both sides of that the positive you know reinforcing through something that's a treat or taking pressure away or reinforcing through kind of providing a boundary that's a little more effective um, mm -hmm. or assertive mm -hmm. and so because of that it's definitely something that i've found because i've experimented a little bit with both and i love the people that are experts um mm -hmm. on the positive reinforcement and the treats and those sorts of things and i think it's a big tool set to have and, mm -hmm. and really valuable but i've really found with the horses they seem to stay the happiest and the most balanced when you have both edges like yeah i love this you're so good this is inappropriate <laughs> <laughs> yeah well and, don't you find that with with like your kids yes <laughs> <laughs> like, and, and I was reading something that was talking, it, it was kind of talking about horses learning through boundaries and kids yeah. learning through boundaries and like checking, is this, is this enough? Is this okay? Can I go here? Can I go here? And then when you finally say, that's it, they go, okay. You know, yep. like that. Yep. And the best way that I think was. to figure out if it's appropriate is like mm -hmm. you watch, you know, horses with each other. And if that's, mm -hmm. you know, kind of how young horses are taught like that's the language for them that makes the most sense innately like at a core right. not that we can't teach them you know our versions of things but if we can understand kind of at a core what makes sense to them what's important to them uh then we can make progress faster because we speak to them in a language that they get totally totally yeah because they can either get a kick or a scratch you know you're watching one or the other and, out and there a lot of times the same individual delivers it in the yeah. herd yeah <laughs> yeah yeah completely um, that's really cool. Um, cool. Well, I've almost had you on here a whole hour. <laughs> I have had you on here a whole hour, dear Lord. Um, so I'm going to, um, come back to these questions that I sent to you like so bad. I sent them to you like an hour ago. So I'm so sorry that you didn't have much time to kind of think let me about just, them. Let me just read what they were really quick. Here. I'm, I'm pulling okay. them up myself. Okay. So don't, don't, don't worry. Um, but uh, it's kind of a fun, 
um, yeah, a kind of a fun way that all of us uh, get to know a little bit more about you and, and okay. your uh, perspective here. And you can say you can pass, maybe. Um, I might pass, pass, <laughs> you can, pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pass, pass, pass. Um, I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready. Are you ready? All right. What is the biggest lesson a horse has taught you about yourself? Hmm. Um, how to be humble and the need for me to be more adjustable. Okay. More, adjustable. Um, more like more adjustable, more able to get my energy up to that place that's effective. Like mm -hmm. here's the boundary and more able to come back and give them a rub faster. Yeah. Yeah. And not to be emotionally attached to either one. It's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I've got. And and you know, like learning, I think that that's one big been one of the big lessons for me is that horses have taught me how much my emotions were attached to my energy. Right. So that if I was an emotionally in a certain place, then my energy was at a certain place. If I needed my energy to change, my emotions came along with that. Mm -hmm. um, and horses innately, it doesn't happen. Like we've got, um, we've got a young horse here right now that's here because he's a little bit dangerous and he's been biting and kicking and chasing some people out of the pasture and things. Mm -hmm. um, and his owner, unfortunately, is mm -hmm. also broken because of him at the moment. But he is also inappropriate with other horses. Mm -hmm. And then we have another horse in who's this like sweet, mm -hmm. stoic sort of a gelding. Um, and after, you know, some exposure, we ended up putting those two together and they were standing next to each other. I was cleaning the pin beside them. Have we mentioned staffing is difficult? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and they were just uh, hanging out kind of in this little dry lot space, hanging out next to each other, sleepy faces. And the one who has a habit of being inappropriate with his energy kind of out of nowhere reaches over and bites the stoic one. Mm -hmm. And the stoic one immediately energy shift spins around, double barrels the other one five or six times. Oh, wow. And it takes that long before this inappropriate one goes like, oh, maybe I should move. Right? <laughs> like, times he's like, he doesn't mean it. And by the third time he's like, hey. And by the fourth time he's like, I think I should get out of here. Wow, and by the yeah. fourth or sixth time he's like, okay, I'm going. Right. And, um, and then the stoic, so you'd think, okay, well, we've heard about horse behavior. So then the thing's over. But the stoic one then waits, pauses. The one who's gotten double barreled, it's inappropriate, has a couple licks and chews and is thinking and processing. And then the stoic one casually walks over, pins his ears, and moves the inappropriate one again. Wow. And then he leaves him for a few moments. And then he goes over and casually and he moves him one more time. And the third time he moved him, the one that was inappropriate, he didn't even wait for the other one's ears to get all the way pinned. The other one just kind of walked over and went, dude. And the uh, inappropriate was like, got it. And he like, right. Walked over. And then I get finished with that pin, go dump the manure, come back. And they're hanging out together again. Sleepy totally faces. fine. Yeah. Wow. You know, so like <clears throat> that, I think that lesson with the horses is how can we be who we need to be with our energy without mm -hmm. getting like anger or frustration or fear, those sorts of emotions attached mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, that's interesting. It's um, when Dan was out last week, Dan James, I thought he was a real master of that contrast. He could, his timing was excellent. He, you know, it does a lot of big tricks and big things with his horses for movies. So he's got to get his energy really big for these big things and then come right back down again. And um, I found the contrast in which he taught was really impressive. And then some of the horses that I was riding, I noticed how I did. I would be totally neutral, fine, working through some stuff, no emotion, blah, blah. And I'd go to do something difficult or put a little pressure on. And once I got kind of into that intense mode, I did. I normally find it very easy when I'm in a neutral place to reward and take a break and stop. And, and then when I was really working on something, I realized how like in my brain, I was think, thinking I need to give this horse a pat, but my body was like, but no. not yet. <laughs> and I'm like, why not? <laughs> you know, like do it. <laughs> you know, like, yes. You know? But it was, it was like my energy was so in that intense place where like emotional, I guess that's how you, you put it, which was excellent. Like your energy and your emotions attached where 
being able to bring your energy up and your, your intention up without having it be so emotional. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that one. Um, <laughs> so, and I think, you know, I think I'm like, oh, I'm doing way better. And then we'll get like a new horse in or a more challenging situation. I'm like, oh, well, I got to learn that one again. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know this, this addiction of <laughs> horses. Um, cool. All right. Do you have a favorite training or competition mantra that you reference regularly? Uh, the only one that pops up right now is kind of a funny one. Uh, sometimes you just have to out fumble your horses. Out what? <laughs> fumble. <laughs> you know, like, and that one's particularly on the ground when you're playing with ropes and stuff, you know, like drop yeah. a rope or get one wrapped around your leg and then you like fall <laughs> over and then you just kind of keep going. <laughs> you just got to keep, keep moving on. <laughs> yeah. That's not, that probably won't like make a calendar, but that's the only one I can think of right now. No, but that's actually really good because you're really good at teaching that. Um, and, and I've watched you do this and then I've been in the round pen and tick has, has gotten after me too, because I'll make a mistake and I stop, yeah. you know, instead of just, Oh, I made a mistake. It's what I do. Keep going. Yes. <laughs> you right. know? Yeah, and a lot of times, like if you do keep the flow going and the rhythm, like your horses don't even really don't notice. Even notice. It doesn't matter anyway. Yeah. 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 Interesting. That's funny. Um, <laughs> Is there a piece of advice that someone gave you along the way that you still reference today? Hmm. So many pieces of advice. Um, take care of your horsemanship and it'll take care of you. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I think that one. And I think that one, and I think that even goes to what we said about like being able to set good goals. Like if your goals are based around horsemanship, mm -hmm. it's going to give you the result you wanted. If you got the relaxation you needed in the warm up, you're going to get the better round yeah. or the better dressage test. Yeah. Do you think that they're like, do you think we're getting to a point where they're the word horsemanship might evolve? Or we need a new word? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was not you didn't even have to think about that <laughs> yeah well no because I think it gets vague like I think it was really catchy and then everybody started to use it and then everybody used it for anything that wasn't competition yeah you know or anything that you did with a horse on the ground yeah. um so yeah I think there's there's definitely a space to kind of uh define that in a better way or have each person sort of have their version of it and have you thought of any new catchy words <laughs> yeah right uh, you know i try to think about like well if i don't if i don't use the word horsemanship what i would i use and it's um it's not smooth but i would have to say something from like a psychology perspective because i think it's yeah. you know it's important to understand the horse's psychology first but then also yeah. to understand ours to understand that uh you know when we uh, even just do we get nervous or does our emotion come up when we're practicing something hard? Cause that's a skill that we need to be successful. Like we mm -hmm. need to be able to go to the gym and be like, this is awful. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. Do it some more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and yeah. we need that in the horsemanship business and life, because like if things got hard and we quit, nobody would still be riding horses. Like right. you got it just, yeah. And do it again. And then another year of just hard. Mm -hmm. um, so understanding that that's like a powerful thing for us as people, but it occasionally doesn't make sense to the horses. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I think something around the idea of psychology and understanding the horse first, but not only the horse, because yeah. it is a partnership between us together. Yeah. So understanding them and us and then putting those things together. Yeah. So, so that's you, ha so you haven't found one word. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That that does that. No. <laughs> co brain we to, we, Yeah, we might have to make a new one. <laughs> All right, that's our goal for 2022. <laughs> Redefining or renaming horsemanship. Yeah. yeah, I just I I totally agree, and I like that because there is a balance between you got to know how your brain works, how their brain works, what your behaviors are, what your innate characteristics are, and then figure out how to bridge that communication in a way that. Um, you know, it's healthy for both of you. Yeah. Yeah, totally. All right. Well, let me know when you get that sorted out.
Perfect. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, what do you do when you are seeking inspiration? Mm -hmm. Um, back in the days when I had time for such things, <laughs> I would I would pause and go outside <laughs> and take a breath. Um, because I feel like often, like for me, I'm pretty driven, and if I can just give my own brain space, like. Yeah. I get inspired really easily, or maybe those seeds of inspiration were implanted in me when I saw other people years ago. And then I'm like, oh, I remember them doing that thing. I wonder if I could do that, but I wonder if I could do it bridalless, or right. I wonder if I could do it like with my horse super happy or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes just pausing and taking a break. Uh, yeah. And then when I don't have time for that, then I listen to a podcast while I'm driving to pick up my son from school. <laughs> Words, sister. <laughs> yeah. there's, like, there's so many incredible people. Like you're incredible to listen to David. And there's so many platforms where you can listen to these people, yeah. you know, and it can be inspirational. Um, so either taking a break or inserting a break. But I think the the goal is to get my brain in a different space. Yeah. You know, yeah. like if I'm which laughing. is sometimes hard to do. Like it's sometimes yeah. hard to not just like sit, you know, in silence <laughs> driving the car. You know, I find that sometimes I got to get something started. I got to kickstart myself over into yeah. that podcast or into that space or into that breath. And that transition can be hard when you're yes. just like, go, 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 go. It's almost like you're, you know, something in your brain is telling you, no, you can't stop for a second. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. you got to like business, 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 business. And usually when I get stuck there for too long is when I lose inspiration. So just yeah. finding a way to change my brain space. Yeah. Yeah. Be the leader in your own brain. Yes, that's the <laughs> um, I like that. I know it's funny. The last couple of days we've been texting. I'm taking my son to school. I'm dropping my son off at school. Okay. We'll get that when we get back from school. <laughs> like, no. oh no. When will they drive? Um, <laughs> a few more years. Um, okay. Our last question. Um, have you had an experience or adversity separate from horses in your life that you feel like has directly influenced you as a leader of co-brain thinking horsemanship? <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I did see this one. I did think about this and the adversity, I was like, well, I don't know, maybe you could define it as adversity, but experience, uh, having my son. Yeah. So like having him was what inspired me to write the book that I did write separation anxiety and I feel like it gave me a better perspective on the horse brain and I know that's weird because obviously he's a human but um this kind of innate character thing so like when he was little um the separation anxiety specifically like it's not like I could just explain to him hey mom just needs to go ride a horse or mom's gonna be like I'm just gonna be in that room over there behind the door taking a shower I just need like 10 minutes, like, yeah. please, you know, like none of that uh, when kids are at that innate character level and there's not the logic and there's not like, like it's still terrifying because from a survival mm -hmm. perspective, he needs to be with mom. Like that's what his DNA says. Right. Um, so giving that kind of layering that over on the horses and going like from a DNA perspective, they need to be with the herd. They need their needs met. Like it's not just a, it's only 15 minutes. You've been right. here before, like those sorts of things. Um, so I think he kind of changed my perspective and approach to life a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'd say becoming a mom is probably the, the biggest thing that's influenced my horsemanship. And was there a mo like, was there like a whoa kind of moment or was it just kind of over a period of time that that started, you started kind of to see that, that parallel? Um, I think, I think it was like over the first 18 months. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, over a period of time, but also like on that note, um, in that time, like I also felt a side of me that was this may be too deep for the podcast, but, um, I also felt a side of me that was like more innate. Like it was just mm -hmm. this, like at this primal level when I was being with him, I still had the brain part that was like the business model. Like you need to be out there training this horse. You want to get ready for this show. You have to get fit again. You need to do this. But then there was also this innate part of me that was totally on a primitive level of like, you're exactly where you should be and need to be by being with him right now. Mm -hmm. um, 
so it was this awareness of like this right brain side, maybe in this left brain side, but like this logical thinking side and this like primal existing, just yeah. who I am kind of side. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of feeling both of those and having, being able to be comfortable in one or the other and allowing both to work and both to work at the right time in the right space. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally... <laughs> I totally get it. And I, it's funny that you say that because the other day, Brooks, or the other night I had Brooks in the bath and I had all this stuff I was trying to do. And normally he plays in the bath fine by himself, but I was just sitting in there and, you know, and I just actually kind of woke up in the moment. You know, I don't know if you've ever done that where you're like, I was just, I, I mean, he's three, so it's not like we were talking about anything complex, but <laughs> But he wanted, I knew that that was where I should be and he wanted me yeah. in the space and I was sitting there and I, you know, we're just spending time together. And it's like, when I went in, I was like, okay, I'm going to get him in the bath and then I'm going to go do all this stuff. And I've yes. got 20 minutes while he's in there. And then I just woke up like enjoying this time yes. and I didn't even have to think about it. It was just like, I was there, you know, and it's yeah. kind of, uh, yeah, it's funny that you say that because since then I've thought about it a few different times and like how interesting like young kids are and, and similar to the horses because it's just so genuine like they're yeah. just so right or wrong or screaming or laughing or you know whatever it's just very there's not this you know part of their brain that's developed yet that puts all this stuff with it you know and I feel like they challenge us as moms mm -hmm. in the same way like the horses need us to be able to plan and plan all the horse husbandry stuff and set up the good thing and then when we're with them they need us to just be yeah. Like just be present and be in the moment mm -hmm. and be there. You know, like I'll have students who are like, oh my gosh, this horsemanship is so hard. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, I'm like, you've raised four kids. <laughs> like, you are more than like, yeah. if you have been a mom, yeah. you, you, you got this. <laughs> I told it's so funny. It's but don't you find too like I it's it's funny how um how I can be like pretty pretty sympathetic and empathetic with my kid and with my horses, but with my husband, I'm just like. <laughs> yeah, I haven't, yeah, I haven't found that uh, tipping point. No. That's like the big, like making me a better wife. I'm like, no, do what I do, need you to do when I need you to do it. Yeah, how have you not thought about this already? <laughs> like, I don't understand. Yeah, well, we can only be good at so many things, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Uh, so awesome. This has been so wonderful. It's so it's it's so sad and great that to catch up we have to do a podcast. <laughs> yes, I know. It's good that we get to because otherwise we wouldn't get to catch up. But this I has know. been awesome. I know. This has been so fun. I really I'm so excited. I think our um <clears throat> our audience is gonna love this and hang on to it. And hopefully we'll be able to do some more stuff with you in the future. And yeah. um, you know, you've got a website. You've got, are you on, I'm assuming you're on social media. Is everybody on social media? We are. Yep. Yep. Raising the bar is our social media thing. And bar is. B-A-A-R. Yes. We like Double to be A. Yep. <laughs> Not two R's. Um, B-A-A-R. And, um, and I would, I would recommend the book. Where can people buy the book? Amazon. Amazon. I've heard of it. <laughs> yeah, they, they do all the stuff so that I don't have to worry about it. That's awesome. Um, okay, well, thank you so, so very much. I'm sure um, your family is eager for you to get back to them, and that pot has got to get cleaned. So that's in yeah. the thing. Well, I have to make it dirty first by cooking dinner, and then I'll right. <laughs> sure, sure, Surely the husband's done that already. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, thank you so much, and um, I'm so excited for this to get out to out to the big public. Thanks, Sinead. You're awesome. Thank you. You're awesome. Okay, bye-bye. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation. Before you go, I just want to let you know more about Ride IQ. At its core, Ride IQ gives everyone access to instruction from the best equestrian coaches in the world. It might sound impossible, but with Ride IQ, you get access to the private mobile app that has hundreds of on-demand, listen-while-you-ride audio lessons taught by top riders and coaches in eventing, hunter jumpers, and dressage. Here's how it works. You look through the app and choose a lesson based on your horse or a skill you're working on. There are lessons for green off-the-track thoroughbreds and nervous horses horses and horses that are behind the leg, as well as lessons that teach every stage of skills like shoulder in or trot lengthenings. Then you tack up and press play and you have a top coach like Doug Payne or Leslie Law or Gina Smith 
in your ear guiding you every step of the way. If you enjoyed today's episode, it is always appreciated if you can take a moment to share the podcast with your friends and family and leave a review on your podcast app. The best way to support the podcast is to become a Ride IQ member at ride-iq.com. And when you do, we hope you're excited to see that In Stride is just one of multiple podcast shows on the app, including hack chats, conversations with coaches, and more. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful week. And please do press follow or subscribe on whatever podcast platform you listen on. And as always, remember to pat your horse.